Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Polygon Gallery's online event on cultural humility in an age of growth. My name is Jen Sunshine, and I have the distinct privilege of introducing this event featuring Kim Haxton and Suzanne Yanis. With a special screening of Suzanne's film, The Land Teaches Us Our Ceremonies, Not the Laboratory. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that I am joining this virtual event from the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. And though I'm not in the office today, the Polygon Gallery is located on the village of Asklehan, home of the Squamish peoples. When I take the sea bus to and from work every day, I am reminded of just how deeply my artistic practice is informed by the waters of the ocean that carried my migration from Taiwan to this land. And the same water that runs through my body also flow into cross-cultural tributaries that nourish and sustain me. Here, I'd like to encourage everyone to please drop in the chat, the traditional lands from which you're joining and answer this question. What is one element about the land that draws you in the most? I'd like to give everyone a sense of tonight's format, as well as a reminder that we are recording this webinar. Shortly after my introduction, we're going to jump right into a screening of Suzanne's film, which is about eight minutes long. Then Kim and Suzanne will have a 30 minute conversation together approximately. Then at around seven, we'll take a few audience questions from the chat. Finally, we'll close the virtual event with a repeat screening of Suzanne's film to come full circle and to end the night. Now, please post your questions or insights into the chat throughout the film and conversation. I'm certain Kim and Suzanne would both really appreciate it. The film we're about to see was produced and directed by Suzanne Yanez, who was part of the Polygon Gallery's response program cohort in 2022. The film features Kim Haxton on the effects of the psychedelic movement as cultural genocides. Now for the screening of The Land Teaches Us Our Ceremonies, Not the Laboratory. I can remember a time when we were doing an all night ceremony and we were dancing around the fire and the ceremonies, as you know, go from dusk till dawn, right? And I think we were in about, maybe about the third round. It was late, late at night. We were dancing around the fire, beautiful songs. And uh, the teaching I received was that the plant medicines don't have any ego. And for thousands of years, these plant medicines have been directing and teaching. Uh, there's a Northern Haida elder, and he said, the land, it teaches us our ceremonies, it teaches us our language, it teaches us our laws and how to be together. And that night with the medicine, I understood all of that. And I feel really privileged in being able to use uh, sacred plant medicines and how they are teachers. You know, there's... Um, there's a teaching of how the plants hold cosmic universal teachings and intelligence. And, and when I think about that, I'm just so honored and humbled to be able to receive that kind of sacrament. It's interesting with the psychedelic world and it's in its infancy, it's this little baby, you know? I know that European culture has used it 2,000 years ago, plant medicines, but it was squashed out, you know? And then it's reemerged since the 1950s, which really, you know, isn't that long ago. And then it disappeared, and so really we're looking at an age time of 40 years, 50 years, really. I mean, there's medicine, medicinal use, but in the way that it's hit the mainstream right now, and the markets, it's like full of a lot of not lineage and sacredness. It's, it's sad, and I feel responsibility to those lineages, you know, to stand and cr to do in a cross-cultural way. 
you know, uh, of, of watching in the psychedelic world. You know, the monetization of, of sacred plant medicine, you know, is, is crushing. So it's interesting in watching sort of their, as one of my uncles would say, our younger, our younger relatives, you know, coming in with the psychedelic world. And with that comes a lot of um, arrogance, you know. You can take a course in four to eight months and be a therapist and, mm -hmm. and it's not a lineage, you know. And, and I think there's such a powerful gift in in the medicines that have been given to indigenous people and I'm seeing a resurgence mm -hmm. of plant medicines that have been shared. The plant medicines that have been shared from the, from the south mm -hmm. here have spurred people to remember their own medicines mm -hmm. that are growing here. Mm -hmm. And so there's a gift that is being exchanged in the cultural, uh, in cross-cultural exchanges with indigenous nations mm -hmm. that I think is so important. You know, um, different teachers that are in this time that we're at, you know, different teachers that can come in and travel and and people can go to their places, you know, when there's a gift. And I think it's really important uh, as for Indigenous people to be supporting Indigenous people in this healing. You know, in order for us to do the healing that we need, you know, this is one of the places that I think is important. And to me, um, with the medicines, I, I see that the gifts of reciprocity and inclusion that exist within Indigenous communities, I see the, the time it takes to learn that we don't have that in a fast food culture, you know, um, and how those gifts are shared and how the teachings are shared by watching and sitting and being, you know, and I think I've only been on my journey for 22 years and, and I don't, I feel like I've got a lot more to learn, you know. Mm -hmm. The songs bring us on journey, mm -hmm. you know, songs are about resonance, it's a transcendental language that, you know, reaches across all of the barriers, mm -hmm. you know, it's simple with the, with, with the place of connecting to the elements. You know, and the songs, yeah, and the things that we share, the cross-cultural sharing that goes beyond language, mm -hmm. you know, that's in a place that sits sort of awakening for people, I think, with the medicines. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the plants kind of help us keep, you know, I think the big thing that I see is like, how do we integrate it all, mm -hmm. right? How do we integrate those teachings? I have a really special rattle that was given to me from an elder from uh, down in the south at Peyote elder. And uh, he did medicine and laid in a hammock and was shown a waterfall. And the stones that are in my mm -hmm. rattle are from that waterfall, mm -hmm. you know? And I think of the sound when I'm playing my rattle mm -hmm. of a waterfall that's in southern, the Oracona Basin uh, and the sound of that rattle and what it, the medicine from the water that it brings, mm -hmm. that it carries, mm -hmm. you know, and understanding that the science of fire when we light our pipes, the medicine, you know, that helps us reconnect. And that's the thing with the psychedelic world is mm -hmm. that's the problem. You know, mm. uh, is that it's like, okay, take a course and there you go. And, and it's harmful, you know, mm. it's harmful. And it negates again because it's based on sort of the culture of white supremacy, mm. you know, of taking and fake appropriation, mm -hmm. you know, that it, it actually can cause a lot of harm. And it's not that there aren't people who are holding the integrity, mm -hmm. but, you know, the lack of the word resonance we talked about isn't there, you know, there's a lot of disharmony, there's a lot of 
things and my experience of watching people and being like, hmm. And then I remember, oh yeah, they're just like a little cousin that doesn't know. <laughs> and, and so I'm able to, you know, not to be, you know, glib with the people, but just in order to hold it, to be like, yeah, there's medicine. And there's medicines all around. Please join me in welcoming Kim Haxton and Suzanne Yanez. Um, Kim, do you want to go first? <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. I'm Kim. Uh, I am. Uh, I'm uh, from Wasoxing. My family's origins are from Wasoxing. Uh, I'm Potawatomi from the Martin clan. Um, I'm also part of the 60s scoop, which I think is really important to locate myself. I also live here on the unceded territories of Coast Salish people. It's really beautiful. And uh, and I've been using medicines for a number of years and follow different than a lot of people I get to working with different indigenous cultures who haven't lost their pre-Columbian spiritual teachings. And I feel really privileged that I've been able to learn from different cultures in my work. And yes, and this is an amazing human being that's out in the world. So please <laughs> bring yourself in. Mari Mari Pulamien, Inche Susan Pinyen, Tanicha Ui Silva, Tanya Nuke Ui Yanez, Tuwam Viña del Mar Mapumeo. Um, my given names are Susan Silva on my father's side, Jan is on my mother's side, and I was born in the Walmapu and what is known as Viña del Mar today in South America and Chile. Thank you so much, Kim, for joining us today. I, I was expecting to have this, this post-screening conversation for a long time, so I'm really excited finally here. Um, I am a cultural facilitator. Um, an artist myself. I have been walking with plant medicines. Um, if if we take it, you know, the the self medication that we do as youth uh, for a long time since I was a, a teenager, uh, but formally in ceremonial spaces um, for this past eight years. I'm currently in the unceded Nayeri territories down in Mexico um, with my husband's family of the Wirradika Nation. And um, I'm, I'm really excited to be here with everyone today. We have a, a little PowerPoint that could be put up. Michael. Thank you. So yeah, we... Um, we are inviting everyone today to uh, take a little bit of a different approach um, to the mainstream narratives that are uh, currently being uh, shared within the psychedelic movement. Um, I'm sure that uh, most of you have seen in the news some of the uh, achievements, you know, that uh, both the Canadian society and the U.S. communities have made so far in the steps of decriminalization, um, which are, you know, including plant peoples and plant medicines. Um, and so we thought about how could we call this, this conversation today in uh, cultural humanity, humility in an age of growth uh, with Kim Haxton and myself. Thank you for, to the Polygon Art Gallery for facilitating this space. We're really excited. And um, we can go to the next slide. As um, it's not every day that, um, you know, we hear 
in the mainstream um, considering considering plants as peoples, though this is mostly an indigenous led conversation that we're trying to bring into the spaces that often negate and omit the perspective of indigenous peoples. We're not just human peoples, we're also plant people and the way that we care for them are based on land-based teachings. Um, for those of you who are not aware with those terms, um, there are many indigenous academics and um, that have written about these things that are pushing for, um, you know, building those connections with the land that often are uh, purposely erased within urban centers uh, by colonial systems and governments that, uh, as we know, historically have tried to erase indigenous cultures through genocides. And um, Kim has been uh, a great teacher and mentor, as well as leader in the psychedelic community, who has been holding the ground uh, in those spaces where, you know, oftentimes the narratives remain very Eurocentric and very blindsided by um, narratives that don't necessarily recognize or acknowledge uh, the full spectrum of what walking with plant medicines and bowls. And um, we can go to the next slide. Kim and I have prepared five different points today for all of you, um, comparative narratives of psychedelic and indigenous communities. Uh, where we will be going through each of these points and giving more details as to the perspective that we're coming from and why we're doing the work we're doing. Um, individualization versus community healing, rationalization versus spirituality, monetization versus the care of plant relatives, colonial legalizations versus indigenous laws, and cultural mis misrepresentation versus authentic spokespeople. And um, Kim, do you wanna do you wanna sure. to this a little bit? Thank you. Um, I think you know this. It's it's kind of hard to separate this from all of the conversation. So you'll have to forgive me as we weave and we reweave in this conversation because it, there's a thing around uh, what I'm seeing in the psychedelic industry and in. The world of academia is sort of a level of individualization, you know, which is which is part of a sort of a, a, a colonial narrative of this is what I've achieved, this is what I'm doing, and it's a very different sort of place when you're going in because of the research, um, going in for a session, uh, uh, whether it's psilocybin or uh, ketamine right now in the mainstream or MDMA, and it's a one-on-one -on -one sort of thing, instead of a place where it's about uh, healing together in community. And there's a different place in which that framework, again, keeps the silo and keeps that measure of um, uh, ego, uh, one thing I see, and then the lack of place of relational place, which is reciprocity, not only with communities whose medicines that the lands come from, but also in a place with the land itself. And uh, I think there's a piece there that when I, when you look at the communities who still have this part of their this that relationship intact, you know, there's their their relationship with the natural world, you know, um, is is in a place of literally reciprocity because the the medicine that comes from the the land, you know, gives that place of how how people care for the land. And I think about that in a number of uh, different contexts. I just don't want to keep on talking because I will, you know, I will. And um, but when I think about that, I think about how, uh, you know, as a moment of awe and wonder, whether or not you've done psychedelics, when you watch a sunset, you know, or you watch the stars and that moment where you can have that level of connection, there's something about there's a level of responsibility when in using the medicines and how it teaches you know, uh, different medicines teach us that, you know, we, it in, it deepens our relationship with land protection, land, 
uh, understanding, you know, how that works. And I just want to give one last quick thing on this is I think of um, Trisha McCabe and she talks about how uh, Venus, the morning star uh, is the male principle and transmits the intelligence of the universe to the plant medicines or to the earth and the earth, she responds as a feminine principle, idea, ideal, I, that principle uh, responds by growing all these medicines and that, but the intelligence that is directed from the universe is a, is a, is a response to the, a reaction response to that. And I think in that relationship itself, when you take some of these medicines, you know that that is true. You know, you know that, you know, what you're taking and the lessons where the lessons come from are, are, are pretty big. And when we look at the state of the world, she talks about, you know, we do not submit to the sacred anymore with ceremonies. Some communities do, um, but we live in a state of chaos because we don't have that natural relationship. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I think about myself um, and where I'm coming from and why I, I do this work. And it stems from that responsibility, right? As a person of mixed ancestries that was not raised as Indigenous, um, even though, um, you know, my DNA says I do have 50% of Indigenous um, ancestries. And I think it's been a little bit diluted from my both of my lineages uh, through my great grandparents. But, um, and, and then also working and benefiting from living on unceded territories when I am in Vancouver, in so-called Vancouver, you know, with the Musk, Lamb, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Um, I came to plant medicines from that need of connection, uh, from that need of healing as a survivor of intergenerational trauma, of erasure within my own family, of negation of my indigeneity, and... Um, also as a, as a survivor of domestic violence. And so in 2017, I was introduced to elders up in Chachlip, um, in what is known as Litluit, elders from the Satlim Nation who were leaders in holding the International Indigenous Leadership Gathering. And through that gathering, they invited um, plant and ceremony leaders, plant medicine ceremony leaders uh, from all across the world, indigenous leaders, uh, that then gathered and, and offered and shared to have that those intercultural conversations that are so needed. And so through that, my own path of healing, um, when I was able to, you know, let go of some of the wounds that I had grown with, I realized that I was accessing a lot of privilege, um, especially when I was invited to receive the presidential scholarship at Quest University up in Squamish. And I said, well, I have received so much from elders, indigenous elders and communities. What can I do to give back? Um, and that's when my research with the with the Wurradika Nation started. And um, we always keep because those are the teachings of the elders, and right, like we are sitting with these plant medicines. It starts. It started for me as healing, but the more that I spend time with my husband's family the more that I spend time with the elders in ceremony the more I realize is that it's a connection that is so much deeper a relationship that is so much bigger than just a healing right and it's not just for ourselves it's that commitment that is lifelong and giving back to the land to the people for sustaining us for being able to maintain you know the food growing and the teachings and the wisdom and the capacity to survive difficult moments. And so um, I know that we had also talked, uh, Kim, about this, you know, how most of the time people interpret plant medicines within the psychedelic world only for healing, right? And, and that's, again, going back to your, your story about the Venus star and, and the land and Mother Earth, um, taking that as an as a further um, as a further step of connection, of commitment, mm -hmm. of responsibility, of reciprocity, which entails much more than, than just individual healing. Next slide, please. The rationalization versus spirituality. 
I'll start with that one. <laughs> That's so funny. It's uh, I was thinking about you know with what's happening within sort of the mainstream psychedelic world or the research world is there's there's a problem of rationalizing within academia, uh, rationalizing and compartmentalizing. And that's a very different experience than being in a ceremony. And, you know, I get a lot of questions from the psychedelic world. Well, how do we bring ceremony in? And it's just like, whoa, slow your roll, you know, because uh, it becomes a thing where we know that things become commodified and ceremony isn't something that you just be like, look at this and then you repeat it, you mirror it because it's, there's a lot of uh, through, I think how knowledge is passed is through um, uh, sort of apprenticeship, right, is through uh, years and years of learning at, rather than, you know, uh, um, the way that the, sort of the other world is is moving at, at, at such a fast pace. And I think there's a problem with the rationalization. You know, I saw a really amazing uh, neuroscientist. It's funny, he just put out a new podcast and he was talking about telling me all about how the brain works with different medicines, whether they're psychedelic or whether they're, you know, the entheogens like the, you know, uh, uh, psilocybin or peyote and, you know, what happens in our brain with neuroplasticity. I'm not going to go further than that because I actually, <laughs> I, I can't describe what he said anyways, but basically, and then I said, yeah, but you said all of that stuff, which is cool. But what about the mystical aspect that happens? And he's like, oh, well, yeah, no, we don't, that's not, we don't really know, you know, or, you know, the, the, and, and so when I think of what the uh, medicines can bring us into, you know, which is about whatever this, whatever the connection is to each other, ourselves, and the intelligence of the universe, which is kind of awe inspiring, you know, it doesn't fit within a rationalization uh, sort of into the research of his studies and you know it becomes complicated and convoluted and that's the problem because most people that's as far as they go you know in it and it becomes a thing where that becomes also the the policies are made out of that and uh, um, are bound by uh, sort of a fragmented place rather than a place of uh, of deep of submitting to this or submitting to the surrender absolutely um and that's that's one of the main problems that um come through you know the medicalization of plant medicine mm -hmm. um into um colonial frameworks of healing right mm -hmm. um which are based off empiricism and positivism and falsifiability which are all tools of a colonizer to basically say that anything that does not fall within those lines is either less valuable than or wrong or, you know, basically not true or not scientific enough to hold um, the, the weight, mm -hmm. hold enough weight to influence policy and influence the ways in which um, public uh affairs are treated right how do we manage community how do we manage populations um within these frameworks that are completely um you know uh like a like a horse um very very narrow sighted mm -hmm. into a eurocentric perspective that mm -hmm. leaves aside so much of the meaning um, the meaning and the meaning making that indigenous communities and elders mm. you know, have had for thousands of years. And, and this is also, I think, the most fascinating thing is that people outside of indigenous communities don't often think of this this way, but ceremony and sitting in a circle mm -hmm. and gathering in community and having conversations and you know even going out for a walk if you're going to hunt or do traditional ancestral practices that are you know uh, people's rights is research it is science indigenous science has existed since time immemorial and just because it doesn't fall within the definitions of the current mainstream beliefs belief systems doesn't mean that it's less than or should not be taken into consideration. And so, um, yeah, it's a very exciting time. 
<laughs> to think about these things. I think there's something that's happening right now, and I want to name this, is that there's a, there's a big ask from the psychedelic industry of like, oh, well, you're indigenous, can you help us? You know, but it is so uh, short-sighted in who they're asking, right? Just because you're indigenous and maybe you've done a few ceremonies, people are getting asked to step in. And I think it's a real cautious because it's just like, well, what about the elders, you know? And what does that teach us about those, building those relationships, which are slow because I think there needs to be trust built. And I think it becomes a problem, you know, around this. And I mean, you could go, I could go on and on because it's like, you know, I know that universities are talking about traditional ecological knowledge, but you know, when they say that they're not listening to the waterfall, for example, you know, that's not really something, again, that's a limitation. Maybe the next slide. Or are you going to say something? No, it's all good. The monetization versus the care of plant, plant relatives. Um, and then as, as well, the exclusivity instead of inclusivity. Um, you know, just, just taking, a, again, from what you just mentioned, um, the mere idea of being able to communicate with, you know, plant and land relatives is something so foreign to um, most of the global leaders in in, in this movement, um, unless they're on plant medicines, right? Because you can hear people saying like, oh yeah, I was able to connect with the land and, and I melted into the universe and I had a cosmic experience. Um, when I was on such and such plant or such and such substance, um, but it's not something that is then taken to the everyday experience, right? To the um, oh, this word that you had mentioned, Kim, in our conversation um, um, about uh, the mundane, right? The, the mm -hmm. everyday experiences, the little things that happen that we don't realize are um, small and you know um i don't want to say insignificant but that that don't have that yeah. you know uh, fireworks effect but still have that importance um and still have that teaching and wisdom carried within it that elders and communities have been listening to for since time immemorial for thousands and thousands of years and so how can we put a price <laughs> <laughs> on these things <laughs> i think it's really challenging i just want to put it in context for people who aren't involved in the psychedelic industry is that you know there are all of these i don't know what the proper term startup companies that are out there that are uh you know banking on making a lot of money off of a lot of these medicines you know in the name of healing and yet the very people who are sort of stewarding them you know are kind of like uh I don't, this is a, this is, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but bros who, you know, are like money trader, it's probably not the right word, people with money, you know, which I kind of understand, but it becomes problematic in like time is money and, you know, and the lack of, you know, how it gives back to community and how it, there's, it's so, it's such a fast tsunami. When I, I spoke at MAPS uh, in the US at Denver with 12,000 people there, and uh, there was a brother from Ecuador who got up and said, you know, you don't know what you're doing. You know, like the out outcome of what's happening right now in the psychedelic industry, we're going to see in 20 years because the people that are serving medicine, you know, are um, haven't done their own healing work yet. And that's problematic on on what happens because of that you know and he said we don't do it and he was like a, i don't know how old he was a younger guy and uh and he said it's our elders that you know host this while we learn until we come into the right time to do that and it really stuck uh with me when he said that you know because right now we're looking at something else within a sort of a capitalist patriarchal system which that's the system we live in but i'm also like eek you know uh it is, uh, it's really challenging. Absolutely. And, and that's why, you know, we speak about cultural genocides. That's why mm -hmm. we take it to that level because, um, you know, we can think of plant medicines that have gone through this process already, mm -hmm. like tobacco and coffee, 
and people don't consider them plant medicines, right? They're not included in the psychedelic mm -hmm. movement, but they are plants that have been used for ceremonies since time immemorial by different nations around the world. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, you know, um, there's there's so much health problems that ha the cigarettes have caused from the mismanagement of industries and colonial, you know, systems and peoples um, mm -hmm. that, you know, don't know how to handle such sacred relatives and instead create and turn them into um, tools for destruction, right? That's mm -hmm. taking something that is um, part of people's families, people's stories, people's lineages, um, is it and turning that into something for destruction is a tool of colonization and that's how why we're trying to um share this 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 perspective is because people don't realize how you know the simplest actions that they're taking today and that they consider inoffensive um are actually pre reproducing cultural genocide are reproducing the same colonial avenues for um, you know, suppressing indigenous ways of being and suppressing suppressing um, the future generation's rights to the medicines, rights to their practices, rights to their knowledges. Mm -hmm. And so can we can we walk in a way that we recognize that cultural humility where we don't know, what we're doing right we don't can we recognize that we're very young into this world of plant medicines as compared to elders that have walked and led generation after generation after a lifetime of commitment to support the rich the revitalization that indigenous communities are working so hard to mm. provide to help uh, contain the decline in native populations of plant medicines so that we can further nurture that indigenous plant care, right? Yeah. We have the next slide. I'm just being mindful of time too. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Colonial legalizations versus indigenous laws, genocidal policies and stories of the land. I mean, automatically I think of this, I think of Darcy and Tracy Lindbergh out of uh, Un University of Victoria. And they both, they did their doctoral thesis on challenging Canadian law, constitutional law with traditional Cree law. And I was with Darcy when he was doing his um, dissertation and we were on the land with a bunch of elders. And he looked at me and he said, this is where the law comes from, are these plants. As we were, they were trying to convince me to snuff this medicine and I was like that's poisonous they're like no sniff it and I was like oh gosh you know and I think I think of I think of those moments like that you know when I think of that when I think of that Haida elder which I spoke to who said you know th this is what teaches us you know this is what our where our laws come from and our ceremonies and our language comes from and so it's interesting that that's starting to perk up but we're still not the narratives that are continuing within these structures and I think that's really important to address is that the structures are the very structures, you know, based on a foundation that is ex ex exclusive, exclusive. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I remember I took a class when I was up at Quest called The Consent of the Governed. Um, that was a very odd class to have at the university. It was taught by an older uh, Caucasian, older white man. Um, and he was basically saying that, you know, racism only started in the last uh, 100 years when it was very clear that the um, arguments and the reasoning that was taken to, you know, create the foundations of Canadian governments and other colonial governments around the world, um, the constitutions and the confederations that were written were based on this idea of um, discovery, right? This idea that it was a no one, no no man's land that uh, indigenous peoples were savages, and like these terms and verbiage is very clear and written in these books, mm -hmm. and it's it's impossible to think that laws 
that are still based, you know, from these structures will be able to actually take care of plant medicines in a way that is respectful of the people, not just the human people, but the plant people, right? If they're not even able to recognize um, indigenous peoples as people, since in Canada, the Indian Act is still active, right? Mm -hmm. It's still standing and it's still oppressing indigenous folks. Um, and not just in Canada, there's many other different uh, legislative structures that are continuing to oppress and dispossess indigenous peoples from their lands, from their teachings, from their languages, from their practices. And so can we bring back indigenous laws? Can we take that into consideration um, within these colonial systems? Next slide. <laughs> That's so funny to say that, right? And then we have the last slide, which is cultural misrepresentation versus versus authentic spokespeople. Um, I we we thought of of different ways of um, you know. There's often people calling themselves shamans and calling themselves medicine leaders when they when they don't necessarily have the belonging to the communities. They haven't necessarily done the proper protocols and traditions. They haven't asked for permission. They don't have community intentions. They're not reciprocal. And so, Kim, take it. Yeah. I'm like, I, I, I think people get this, you know, because it's like, you know, how do we do, how do we move from cultural appropriation to cultural appreci appreciation? How do we understand that the lineages, you know, especially around plant medicines, I think, as an example, you know, what does that mean to be actually properly trained? you know, and not in a five hour course, because apparently I heard that in the States, there's a, you can do a five hour facilitate, be a facilitator of medicines. Um, how do we understand that relationship? How do we understand in a place where, you know, who are the voices that we're listening to? Because, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty trendy, you know, uh, uh, to be a psychedelic facilitator or um, plant medicine and, and I have questions about like, who's doing it in authentic ways, you know, um, who, how are we holding that, you know, within a system where there's policies that are making it exclusionary. Uh, yeah, like for example, in Oregon for a psilocybin, a mushroom journey, it's like $3,600, you know? And so we're looking at these some things um, uh, that are really challenging that, because of the exclusion and because of, you know, uh, who gets access to those programs is, uh, is, is part of the problem. And so how do we have authentic people within the industry, you know, and how do we check the narratives that people are also carrying on both sides, you know, like, and I say that because I've been working in the psychedelic industry, you know, on basic, you know, equity inclusion conversations. And it's kind of shocking, you know, some of the major people who are in psychedelics. And I just kind of saw a comment there. The, there's amazing work that's happening in with with the medicines, but the challenge is, is that the policies and who gets to serve medicine and how that is, is uh, it's um, problematic. Yeah, absolutely. It's exclusionary, right? It the mm -hmm. even even to think um, the medical systems are still racist and are still based off uh, statistics that mostly serve people, you know, of white communities. Um, the books, the way that the books are written, the ways that the uh, pharmaceutical industry was created, the way that. Um, Who's who actually the people that are being researched is actually a surprising number of who gets to access to that research. And, and surprisingly, it's part of the problem that it's just a, it's a blind spot, which is interesting because we take medicines to get past the blind spot, but for whatever reason, it's still a blind spot. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and, yeah, you know, I often think about, do we have enough elders to, to be out there? <laughs> and and um, share the teachings and is there enough people that are willing to take on the commitment um, and and go slower and actually listen to 
you know, the, the teachings of the elders and the practices that are needed and the protocols mm -hmm. um, and involve the local communities where these policies are trying to be pushed on, right? Not just where the plants come from, but also the lands where uh, decriminalizations and legalizations are happening have indigenous folks like do they even want to have that those things to happen on their territories right it's a it's a very complex conversation that uh, deserves time and dedication in a way that um, allows for the proper recognition of indigenous people's rights and their sovereignty mm -hmm. and that the you know the united nations declarations of rights of indigenous people supports and um yeah I think it's time for the Q&A. Thank you, Kim and Suzanne, for that enlightening um, conversation. Uh, we do have one giant question slash uh, comment, many questions actually embedded into one from Elliot, um, who says, there have been some breakthrough medical applications for psychedelics to treat mental illness. The psychedelic industry, read bros, is so much oops, is so much about the unquantifiable, transcendence, spirituality, and even ceremony in ways that are very disrespectful and appropriative. How do you distinguish tech bros trying to optimize their consciousness? from the neurological and therapeutic research that is rigorously happening? Or do you see both of these as part of a single psychedelic industry that's inherently violent against indigenous ways of being? Elliot, all of the above, right? <laughs> you know, you've got people coming in um, who are having moments of like, oh, hang on a second, you know, uh, who uh, this summer I hosted the psychedelic gathering at Hollyhock and and Uncle Who's territory and they uh, a, a bro came in from that industry and he was invited to talk and he's like hang on a second I'm I came in to talk about money and growth and and they said I just realized right now that I need to be authentic and he said, that's, this is so unusual, you know? And it was really cool to see him. It doesn't mean it's gonna stop or whatever, but I just think, you know, there's an arrogance of people having spiritual, a spiritual moment and then banking on it. You know what I mean? Um, I think commodifying it because, oh, I'm gonna serve this because I can make, you see it a lot in the 5MEO DMT world where you see uh, folks who are like, ooh, and then, running off and making you know thousands of dollars but when you actually look at how much it costs to make that you know not necessarily the frog medicine but the actual synthetic version of that it's like it doesn't make sense you know and people are like woohoo it's like it becomes this uh what is the, whatever the word is you know yeah and and actually you know the slides that we made for today were based off um a flow chart that I created a couple of years ago in a class called the science of health and West wellness at Quest University, where we're, we were analyzing basically a health claim. Um, all of the research that is happening, no matter how well intentioned, um, continues to support the narrative that Western medical frameworks know better than, than indigenous peoples. And it continues to further push the idea that things can happen without Indigenous people's consent uh, because people are not consulted. They're not involved in those researches. Indigenous folks are not, um, don't have a voice in the papers that are written. And I know this uh, firsthand because I'm uh, working as a cultural facilitator for the UBC Center for Migration Studies right now on um, research with UBC and the amount of work that it has taken the professors and tenure to understand that we can't just simply speak about, you know, belonging on unceded territories um, without including the host nations, without including the people from the land, without including uh, 
um, you know, those who have um, traditional and ancestral authority to, you know, say the last words, to have the last say on how the research results look like. Um, and the same happens to the psychedelic community. We have another question from Natalie. How can we actually approach ethically sourcing places slash people to receive and practice these medicines? <laughs> um, there are, you know, definitely limitations to traveling and going to the territories from where the plant crumps from. But if, you know, you, people have the capacity and they have um, the opportunity and really want to connect not just to the plant or the effects of the plant, but actually to the land where the plant comes from and the people where that have, you know, um, been the stakeholders of so said plants since time immemorial, definitely that's always the first avenue. Um, there, there are horrible stories about also uh, indigenous peoples being influenced by capitalist systems and becoming abusive with the plant medicines themselves. So always go through trusted channels and networks, you know, mm -hmm. um, go to where people recommend you, people that you trust recommend you. Um, there are also traveling elders that have taken their life commitment to share the medicines um, in a way that is respectful of their communities, that mm. are supported by their communities and their families, that are recognized as well by their communities and their families that have done protocol and traditional training to have the rights to carry the medicine. Um, and, you know, people like Kim and I are connected to those communities. <laughs> yeah. But, Yeah. Look who they're surrounded by. I think that's a big clue. You know, I, I definitely that is a huge clue because I see some of the people where I'm just like, well, this is like a little rock star. OK, you know, and, and it's OK. But there's like level of when we say humility, you know, people who are from the earth. Right. That's what that's about. So I think it's important. Thank you both. Um, I want to throw in a last question. Um, it's, a, it's a personal question uh, somewhat, um, and also just out of my own kind of curiosity. Um, Kim, I've known you for years and have, you know, your reputation. Um, yeah, and and Susanna, I'm just so thrilled to, um, to have met you through this incredible uh, event. Uh, my personal question to you is because I'm curious about how people grew up and what, um, and it's my favorite question to ask, which is what were you like as a kid? And if there is kind of one sort of definitive moment or moments um, that you can pinpoint where you, you know, you're like, oh, that was it. That was when I, you know, turned into this, or this was the start of this and that. Um, it's one of my favorite questions to ask, so I wanted to kind of throw that to both of you. Um, I know, because I really want to know. I think I just had the, the moment that flashed to my brain. I mean, there's a gazillion moments, but was uh, I shared a bunk bed and it was like summertime because it was late at night and I was looking at my hand as a, I was in grade one. And I was looking at my hand and I understood that there were, that this was the universe, that my hand was part of the universe and made up of that. And even though like the community, the family I grew up with, I had no idea, but I remember understanding that looking at my hand, tripping out as a little kid and being like, cool, you know? That's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was raised in a Jehovah's Witness family. Uh, born and raised, and um, for some reason, everyone always saw me as a little elder. I don't know, but when I was seven years old, I had my first vision dream, 
Mm -hmm. And I was turned into an animal and I was flying and I was like overseeing the little, well, the street that we used to walk every day. And I was going into a church for some reason. <laughs> um, and I think that was the first of a series of dreams that marked my life. And I then became an anarchist and then became just a, a land person. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> uh thank you both um do you want to add there is one more question um so let's let's do you have time and energy to answer that one so natalie asks again what are some mundane ways in which you both have channeled your experiences actually that's a great question because i want to know as well thanks natalie i can go first if you want to think about your answer um, I don't think I channel the experiences. I think, um, well, there are people who are channelers, right? But I don't think that necessarily um, it's it's an individual experience. It's it's a communal experience with the land. As um, we were preparing for a morning circle of one of the research circle with the a group in Vancouver with um, the lead researcher for the UBC Center for Migration Studies. Um, you know, we had had a really hard and tough circle with people sharing really heavy experiences, survivors of war and other things that um, remain confidential as they're part of the research. But um, I said to the, the lead researcher, I said, hey, why don't we go and harvest cedar because I'm just not feeling like I can go into the circle and, um, you know, step into that position of facilitating it if we don't harvest medicines. And it's actually the cedar tree that is in this documentary <laughs> that was right wow. beside our home, uh, close to where we buried some of my, uh, actually our baby's placenta. Um, and um, this was before burying the placenta though. And I was grabbing some of the cedar branches and the, the lead researcher was there with me. And this one branch I grab and I'm like, oh, it has like a little tuft of, of, of leaves. I'm like, that's weird. That's odd. But the moment I like passed my finger through, by it, I realized it wasn't leaves because it was so soft. It was just the most tender uh, softness I had touched in a while and when I look at the branch there is a mummified hummingbird that is holding to the branch hanging upside down and I'm like what are the odds that I find this tiny beautiful little bird that has so much meaning to me personally from my own you know stories and paths that I've walked like what are the odds to find this gift and be witnessed by this person as we're going to bring these medicines to the circle it's little things like that that you say you know it's it's a gift it's not just uh it's not just a you know a vision or uh some uh just some 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 experience on while well, you're high kind of thing it's a natural high <laughs> <laughs> I just think for me it's being in the garden mm -hmm. and caring for my plants and learning from them because they all have personalities it sounds really weird but they do you know and I'm always like what are you doing you know you hear you often hear me in my garden talking to them and you know and and poking and trying to figure out what's going on. But I think that's kind of a place in which, you know, um, yeah, if that if that is answers the question, I don't really understand it. Yeah, I would say that. I would say in how, you know, caring for community and being cared for. Yeah, sitting around a fire and drumming and singing all night, my favorite thing in the world. Wonderful. Thank you, Kim. And thank you, Susan. And on that note, um, 
I want to thank as well the audience um, for, yeah, for your time and for your questions. And again, Susan and Kim, for your generosity and sharing the space with us. Um, I learned so much tonight. Uh, for those who missed the film at the beginning, uh, we will be screening it again very shortly to close out this event. Um, and I am going to thank, and I made sure to clear this with Kim and Susan ahead of time. Uh, I want to thank uh, RBC Foundation for its major contribution to this evening's event. And this is the sixth year of RBC's partnership and support of emerging artists at the Polygon Gallery, and we're tremendously grateful for their continued generosity. And on that note, Michael, who is in the back end, we'll be screening the film again. Thank you, everyone. Thank Have you, everyone. Good night.